I'm Amy Jones from the University of Kentucky. I'm here today with Dr. Eli Capaluto, who has been here at UK for just around one year now. Thank you for being with us, President I'm glad Capilouto. to be here, Amy. Today, we're going to talk a lot about what's going on on campus right now, including the current situation with the budget, as well as how all this plays into Kentucky's promise, not only for UK, but for the whole Commonwealth. But first, Dr. Capilouto, let's just talk a little bit about the current situation with the budget right now. Where exactly do we stand? Sure. Well, our budget process really started a year ago. When I arrived here, I conducted a listening campaign. Uh, I also charged a faculty a staff administrator group to listen and learn. Um, I went throughout our campus and across our state asking people, you know, where are we and where do we need to be heading? Where do we need to focus our attention? We brought all that together to our board of trustees, our findings, and at the end of that retreat, uh, we concluded we should focus on two things. Uh, number one, undergraduate education, so vital to our state and to our university. And number two, uh, revitalizing, restoring the core of this campus, its infrastructure. We have a wonderful tradition uh, going back 150 years, uh, but we also have some 19th century buildings uh, that ne we needed to take a good look at and get started on. With trying to do some of these things, I think UK has been in the news recently because of the budget cuts and some mm -hmm. tough choices that UK had to make. Uh, why, why did those tough choices have to be made? I told you the two priorities uh, on which we were going to focus. Uh, we also recognized that uh, the state, facing its many challenges, uh, couldn't step forward. Couldn't step forward with any money to support our infrastructure. And it also informed us uh, that it was going to reduce our operating budget by some $20 million. That's on top of $30 million worth of reductions over the last several years. So we're operating at a base that's $50 million less uh, than it was in 2008. And certainly the cost of things have gone up. Uh, we looked at our priorities and came back and said, we want to invest in our students so that they could have uh, access to affordable quality education. We wanted to invest in our people, our faculty and staff who make everything remarkable happen around here. And thirdly, we had to start investing in this infrastructure and we had to budget accordingly. We felt that we could meet those challenges when we looked at the totality of our picture, realizing uh, we had really uh, built uh, uh, human resource capability here. Over the last three years alone, our, our faculty ranks, our instructional faculty grew by 9%. Uh, so we have a talented group of faculty here that will allow us to accept a few more students than we did last year and even more next year. And at the same time we were doing all this, we decided it was important uh, to make a commitment uh, to curtail these dramatic increases in tuition uh, that we've seen across all higher education. So we have a planning target next year that we wouldn't increase uh, tuition more than 3%. I know that some of the news in the spotlight has been about workers being affected um, in the last few weeks. Is that something that uh, you've, you've really had to struggle with during this process? I think all of us in the UK family have to struggle anytime we had to make uh, decisions like this. A every person here is recognized as an individual and is valued. They're part of our family and their families are part of our family. Um, but we, we had to make choices that we thought were in the best interest of the university uh, to rebalance our budget to address the priorities that I outlined uh, to you earlier. And um, when we had to make those choices, uh, we took uh, extra steps to be sure that uh, everybody was first afforded the dignity and respect that they deserve. And second of all, uh, we did other things. For instance, if anybody was within a year of qualification for uh, retiree benefits, uh, we bridged uh, that gap so that they would enjoy that and have that uh, security. Uh, anybody who uh, 
had their position uh, eliminated, uh, had 90 days of uh, a salary coverage, and depending on how long you'd been at the university, you, you, you qualified for uh, additional benefits and opportunities. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're a fluid organization with 14,000 employees. This involved 1% of our population. It doesn't mean that we're uh, going to stay still. Um, there's still going to be opportunities for employment at UK. And I've asked everybody to sort of look at this list first. Well, thank you for explaining all of that. And we know that a lot of these priorities that you've talked about um, are something that are part of the Kentucky Promise. Can you tell us just a little bit about what that is and what sure. it means to not only UK but to the state? Uh, I arrived in Kentucky a year ago. I spent the first 90 days and even invested a couple of weeks before I got started uh, listening. And I used to tell people I, I felt as if I had uncovered for me the soul of Kentucky. And, and that soul to me says we have a commitment to each succeeding generation that we fulfilled to make sure they're better educated and their futures are brighter. Right now, the wor world is moving at warp speed. Um, changes in our economy, it's a global economy now. Uh, changes in information technology. Uh, put more people together from more different places, uh, competing uh, in a larger economy, and you've gotta have students best prepared for that. So the promise of my generation is to make sure that that generation that follows us is well prepared, has the brain power that you've got to have in a knowledge economy, that when you graduate from the University of Kentucky, you're ready for a life of leadership, meaning, and purpose, that you have the skill set that is going to prepare you to not just uh, take a job, uh, but to reinvent or create a job. That's the commitment we've got to make to this generation. Specifically, I know you talk about educating Kentuckians. Why is this such an important part of this promise? Well, first of all, as I cross the state, uh, you, you develop an even deeper appreciation uh, for the, the affection everyone has. You also recognize that even in this budget downturn, and even though the state faces many challenges, um, you know, the taxpayers of the state, uh, through their elected representatives, uh, contribute $280 million to this enterprise. Uh, that's the commitment they're making to the future. And they have high expectations. And I want to feel like uh, we're fulfilling uh, their needs that uh, Kentucky keeps dreaming um, for their children and their children's children. Well, you're talking about Kentucky being dedicated to making sure that these students are educated. Here's a story actually about a UK student who overcame all kinds of obstacles to earn his degree. When Jonathan Hurst was an undergrad, his life revolved around sports. My undergrad was in sports management. So it, uh, at the time, it fit perfectly with my, you know, with my dream of becoming a pro athlete, but it doesn't do much good for me now. The reason why dates back to August 3rd, 2005. Hurst was in Iraq completing the last month of his second year-long deployment when his life completely changed. It was about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, Iraq time, um, and our mission, or our patrol ended at 2 o'clock, so we were actually on our way back. We were called that we found an IED on the side of the road or an improvised explosive device, roadside bomb. I was the lead man out of the vehicle and uh, as we were walking to the nearest building so that we could get on the rooftop and, and set up a sniper position, uh, about 10 feet to my right, uh, I remember a flash and an explosion and um, next thing I remember I was laying on my back and uh, screaming to all the guys because I could obviously at that point no, knew that a, a bomb had gone off. I was kind of in and out of consciousness, um, but the, what I was told <laughs> was that I tried to get up and one of my uh, squad members tackled me and had a tourniquet, put a tourniquet on my leg 
Um, and then within 20 minutes, I was on the surgery table uh, with five surgeons. My left leg was missing uh, below the knee. Part of my colon was, was severed. Um, part, my bladder was punctured. Uh, my right leg, the femoral vein was sliced. Uh, a lot of nerve damage, shrapnel. Two days later, I woke up and uh, my entire squad was standing around my bed. Since then, Hurst has undergone 17 different surgeries, battled post-traumatic stress disorder, and the pain every continues. Day. To this day, every day, all day long. Despite it all, Hurst will walk across the stage for this weekend's commencement to earn his master's degree in social work, a goal that started during his rehabilitation process. When I was at Walter Reed, doctors would come in every day and, and high power figures, you know, President Bush would come in and to my room and a lot of different people. Um, but the one person that would come on a daily basis was the social worker at the hospital. And he's the one that uh, really kind of inspired me as I could see that, you know, what he said to me and what he did for me to try to make my, re, uh, my transition process easier. And he was doing this for every veteran that was there. Um, just really inspired me. Hurst admits the transition back to school was tough. My PTSD did play a huge role in, in would I be able to sit in a classroom, a confined classroom with other people, or would the professors understand where I'm coming from? But he says the people at UK's Veterans Resource Center helped. It has been a huge support for me. With Tony Dotson has always been there to answer questions, to offer support, um, to advocate for any veteran that is getting treated what they feel wrongly on campus. So after years of pain and lots of hard work, Hurst hopes to take in the moment as he graduates on Sunday. I hope I earn the respect of my family and friends as I walk across the stage. Respect that goes far beyond his degree. Beyond educating students like Jonathan, who we just saw, you also speak about the importance of UK's impact in terms of outreach and service across the Commonwealth. Why is that so important? Well, that's part of our land-grant mission. And we were a land-grant university that birthed a medical center. And you see it throughout our medical center. All of our health schools or colleges are uh, working in community, um, partnerships with other universities, educating future health professionals. Our hospital in the last seven years has raised its uh, annual admissions from 19,000 to 35,000 patients. They're largely from Kentucky, that increase. We partner with community hospitals to make sure we can provide that specialized care that's typically not available and then get them back to their home community where their local physician and hospital can care for them. Also, I don't know uh, if everybody realizes this, as part of our $280 million budget is the monies uh, that support and a, a great portion of our extension program in all 120 counties. And you can find extension agents that deal with everything from uh, agriculture um, issues. Um, we, we have uh, fine arts agents. Uh, we have those who are trying to increase STEM education, focusing on the science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, they do all those kinds of services. We're only a great university when we're relevant to the citizens of Kentucky. And pro by providing that service, um, every, everywhere from specialized care uh, to what we've done in West Liberty where, you know, Sarah Fanning as a county agent provides uh, home gardening uh, so that folks who are having a tough time can put affordable, healthy food on their plates. When those storms came through and I heard that our West Liberty Extension Office was so heavily damaged, I called Sarah Fanning. And there she was working out of her home. She didn't have much time for me uh, because she was busy at work. She'd already arranged for contributions of feed and fencing, all kinds of things such that uh, uh, those uh, uh, farmers in that area wouldn't have their livelihood threatened. Um, that's the kind of commitment I see every day at the University of Kentucky. It's because they love this institution and love serving their fellow citizens.
UK is impacting the state. Why is it so important that UK serve the whole state of Kentucky? First, we should never forget or get far away from uh, the premise of our founding, and that was to educate the sons and daughters of Kentucky. Today, the world is a lot different than it was 150 years ago. Uh, I just returned uh, from a trip to China where uh, our faculty have been working on some fascinating collaborations. Uh, but during that trip, I was reminded that, uh, you know, when you look at China and India, there are now two billion more people who want to live their version of the American dream. And the competition has gone to a whole other level. And you've got to be prepared uh, to succeed in that kind of environment where the competition is ramped up, where you have to have a toolkit of skills, which we provide here at UK, uh, but one that once you even leave UK, you are prepared uh, to augment in all kinds of ways. I felt confident when I was, on, uh, when I was in China. I saw uh, stu students in our uh, global programs who are learning how to navigate smoothly uh, through uh, sectors of the society, through different cultures, languages. We're doing a great job at preparing our students for this rapidly changing world. Well, when these students get here and they have these opportunities, we want to make sure they have great faculty. Yes. And we definitely do around campus. Our next video features the best of the best professors on campus who were recently named the Great Teachers of the Year by the UK Alumni Association. I love being a teacher. And the fact that the UK Alumni Association recognizes and has recognized for 50 years great teaching is is really special. I am very grateful for this award. I know how many great teachers there are at the university. What touched me the most about the award is, is who it came from. It means recognition. Recognition from the people who count most, which is your students. Uh, it felt uh, great uh, to be, um, uh, to sort of think of the amount of time and energy and initiative that went to it uh, on the part of the students and I was of course very appreciative of that. It means a lot to me, you know, I mean that's one of the reasons why I wanted to become a teacher was to become a good teacher and maybe it just took me a little bit longer than some of the other people. But uh, so in that sense I, it feels good. I, I was recognized for what I hope I do well. I think it's great that the UK um, it really emphasizes the importance of uh, not just sort of um, doing stuff for research purposes, but also doing the best you can to give back to the university, which is uh, first and foremost the students that make up the university. Teaching, of course, is, is essential. A great university really needs great teachers. The teaching should really be teaching, advising, mentoring students should be at the core of our academic mission. You help students understand why they want to study what they want to study and then in the process if you get to know them a little bit through a couple classes you'll understand why they want to do that and then you help them tweak it a little bit. There are things that you can very concretely help a student with that will make her future more likely to be achievable. Great teaching doesn't overshadow or, or discount any other activity, and in fact is the scaffolding upon which all these other wonderful activities and accomplishments are built. When you have that triad of teaching, clinical, and research, and you can bring it all together um, in a learning environment, I think that would kind of what's put UK ahead. I teach because it's something that I can go to work and I can say I love to do. You spend so much of your time at work, it's kind of cliche, but you have to love what you do and I love what I do. I the idea of a university is just a fantastic um, element of what makes our society what it is. Uh, the open exchange of ideas, uh, the enshrinement of values uh, where you can question people. I really uh, admire the space that's been created in society for this kind of activity and engagement and uh, find it uh, very stimulating and um, uh, uh, definitely really love what I do for a living. I just always enjoy doing it and students really keep you going. The fact that I get a salary and benefits is icing on the cake because I get so much satisfaction from 
from the students themselves. It's the students that motivate you and knowing they are ambitious, they want to learn. It's um, seeing students succeed, you know, seeing students do well, seeing them getting a grant, landing a great job, seeing them, I don't know, getting something, reading through the texts and asking questions on their own, questions that don't have a quick and you know, a ready answer. So that, that's really rewarding to me. It's fun to watch students learn. It's fun to watch students get it. And I just love being on the scene when a student sort of gains an insight. It's like the light bulb goes on. You can, you can tell that they, they really understand what you're trying to get across. It's really thrilling to be there as you see them gain in confidence and even competence. There is a lot of satisfaction when you prove something in mathematics that nobody has proved before. That's really thrilling. That's very exciting. And there's even more satisfaction when you write that paper and you get it published. You get it in a good journal and colleagues write and say, well, that's a great paper. But nothing compares to when students, after years, send you an email saying, what you did back then, you know, that really helped me. And you don't even remember what you did. Or when students say, you, you gave me that little nudge back then, and, and this is what I'm doing now, and, and I'm really grateful for that. And getting those emails, that stands out above all the papers. It's clear from that video that faculty really care about the students in their classrooms and their labs. Is that kind of what you found across campus over the past year? Uh, I found that on a sneak visit to Lexington a little over a year ago. My wife and I walked away after that visit and said, this is a place that puts students first. And I see evidence of that every day, just like we um, just viewed in, in the video. And the commitment is broad. It's not just to your education, but we want to make sure that we train another generation of investigators, discoverers. Uh, Amy, I said earlier I'd, I'd returned from a trip to China. Part of that trip was to look for new research opportunities for our talented faculty. In the United States, along with the decline in state dollars, there's now a flattening and, and further decline in the traditional sources of research, uh, namely the federal government, NIH, NSF, and those sources. Uh, you see just the opposite in Southeast Asia. The research and development funds are going in this direction. Well, we have strengths and coincident interest, for instance, with uh, that of China right now. China is a large coal consumer. Its economy depends on manufacturing. It has undertaken an aggressive plan to make sure it achieves energy and environmental security. Here at the University of Kentucky we have the Center for Applied Energy Research. Uh, talented researchers who accompanied me on the trip, uh, Rodney Andrews and uh, Kun Lee Lu. Uh, these were rock stars over there by the way. Uh, we learned while we were there that China is going to invest a thousand billion dollars, a thousand billion is a trillion, over the next five years in uh, clean energy, uh, uh, carbon uh, recapture, um, uh, coal to liquid fuels and so forth. This is the same research that we're leading here at UK. We got a Department of Energy grant to look at these same areas. Well, we have the opportunity now to collaborate with investigators, attract funding from abroad, so that the discoveries that always advance society uh, can advance our state, uh, our country, and, and indeed the globe. You've got to have a rich talent pool to be able to do those kinds of things, to teach our students well and prepare them for the 21st century, and to answer the issues of our day. That's what we have at UK. It is very, very precious. That's why next year uh, we set it as a goal uh, to do an aggressive 5% merit salary plan for our faculty and our staff. We talked about today so far quite a bit, but a lot of it about UK's kind of financial situation right now, but more broadly, what all of this means to Kentucky's promise and the future of this institution. What is your hope for UK's future? What I want people to know is we're going to grow our way to the top by making these investments, using a public-private partnership, 
to put 9,000 new beds on this campus so we can attract the best and brightest and we can make sure that when somebody leaves Kentucky they are the best and brightest because they're going to have living learning opportunities in facilities that lend themselves to a 21st century education. At the same time, while we're investing in this infrastructure, new classrooms, new laboratories, we're going to put Kentuckians back to work. We broke ground on a residence hall just a few months ago. You know, we got a couple hundred people over there working. We can put hundreds more back to work building something that is going to secure Kentucky's future for another 50 years, another 150 years. But we've got to do it now. This is a rare opportunity where construction prices are where they are, where the cost of borrowing money is as low as it is. We have got to seize the moment. And how do we do that? Well, we, we our board of trustees, who I applaud by overwhelming majority, uh, endorsed our first step in the budget that they approved this week. And we're going to be dialoguing with them, our faculty, and our staff over the next several months to understand what's the next best step or steps we can take. Um, we've talked a lot today, um, but I would want to ask you just to kind of wrap up. What is the one message you would want to get out there to the people of Kentucky, if you could, at this point in time? First of all, you should be extremely gratified and proud of what's going, here, going on here at the University of Kentucky. We are fulfilling our promise. And then you should be very optimistic about the future. We are making the hard decisions to secure that future, to win that future for Kentucky. And so the future is extremely bright. And I want everybody to know how much we appreciate their support, their precious tax dollars, the philanthropy that is uh, increasing here. People are generously supporting this university. And it's going to take all of us working together to fulfill this promise. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today about these important topics. Uh, Amy, I'm grateful for the opportunity. If you would like to keep up with all the news from the University of Kentucky or watch this show in its entirety, visit uknow.uky.edu. You can also follow President Capilouto on Twitter, like him on Facebook, or read his blog on UK's homepage, UKY.edu. Thanks so much for joining us.